afternoon, everyone. Hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, we were up with some my nephew's house, and I guess there were 30-something people there, and it was loud, and we had the football game going, lots of food, and it was uh, a real delight. Of course, I was glad when I left because all the noise that was there, but uh, we enjoyed it. We got to see all of our family, and uh, that was a terrific time. We didn't have it at our house this year, so uh, that was even better. We didn't have to clean up the mess, but we had a great time. I hope you had a good time uh, being around your family and thanking God for, as Mark mentioned, for our blessings. And uh, I was at that Thanksgiving looking around that room, thinking about the joy it was to be around all of my family and kids and grandkids and cousins and aunts and uncles and um, I was certainly glad to be with all of them and to see them and because uh, we don't get together that often and uh, it, it is a time of the year that's truly special and a lot of people have fond memories of Thanksgiving as well and hope you did too as well. Do you want to live forever? When I thought when I wrote these words this morning I thought, maybe some people don't really want to live forever. I mean, when you look around this room here and you see empty chairs, you wonder, do, really people, do people really care about the message of the gospel that Jesus preached? There is this goal of many people, though, and have been for many centuries of wanting to live forever, to extend their lifetime, especially in the past. We can go back and look at the great pharaohs and marvel at those enormous pyramids that were built, built to conserve or to per preserve, you know, some ancient person who was preserved or embalmed in, in a way, mummified, and put in this cap encapsulation of stone so that he could go into the afterlife. And you can read all kinds. I've got several books on the pharaohs and on Egypt, ancient Egypt, and how they preserved all animals. I mean, they even preserved horses and owls and and ravens and, and hawks and alligators and, and even other people along with slaves such as that so that he would have slaves and servants and horses and chariots in the afterlife. King Tutankhamun's body was wrapped in many layers of cloth and jewels and amulets. You can study this a little bit. His head was encased in a solid gold mask. If you've ever seen that, you probably would recognize it. Uh, I forget how many <laughs> pounds or uh, it, it's worth, you know, 30, 40 million dollars, I'm sure, at the amount of gold and the jewels that are in that mask. He was then placed inside of a coffin, which was placed inside of another coffin, which was placed yet inside of a third coffin. This was then placed inside of a sarcophagus, which was then put inside of a shrine that was inside of another shrine, then inside of another shrine, and then inside of a fourth shrine. Can you believe that? And of course, this whole contraption was inside of a antechamber, inside of a, you know, a very secretive place, which was the tomb, which was in the Valley of the Kings. And they had a, you know, they dug tunnels to build this place, and painted all the inside of it with these uh, ancient drawings and paintings. And then they covered the whole entrance up and reburied it so no one would find it. And, of course, that was why uh, it was discovered years later. You know, other people have been in search of the, you know, the, the fountain of youth. Herodotus wrote, I think, in the 3rd century B.C. about the fountain of youth, that it was, did it exist? And you've probably heard stories of Ponce de Leon, the French explorer, or the Spanish explorer, that even tried to find the fountain of youth here in the United States, down in Florida. They thought it existed at one time. All of this seeking the ability to extend their lives and perhaps live forever. There is a call that goes out. Jesus made this call. The people of God, the church of God makes this call. It's called the gospel message. It's about salvation and eternal life, which is the promise or the reward of salvation, eternal life. In Mark, the fourth chapter, Jesus begins to make this call, and he makes it to a special group of folks here. I'd like to look at this, Mark, the fourth chapter, down in verse 18. It says, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, so he is up 
in the northern part of Israel around the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now they had... I don't think this is the first time Jesus ever met these guys, and I don't like the old 70s movies of Jesus where he just sort of makes his statement and they look at him like he's sort of a, some sort of a psychic or something and has these power in his eyes to make them follow him. I think he knew of these guys beforehand, but they realized there was something very important about this calling. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. A lot of commentaries say that these four guys were probably associates or partners in the fishing business. And, of course, James and John and Peter and Andrew were brothers, each of them brothers. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. You can go forward in the story in the other accounts where he called you know, Matthew, uh, the tax collector, and of course, uh, chapter, Mark, the third chapter, maybe we could flip over there and look at that real quick, where he called all of the 12, or he spoke to all of the 12, Mark, the third chapter, Mark 3 and verse 13, and he goes up into the mountain, he calls unto whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained 12, that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach, and he, and it, and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out devils. And Simon, his, he surnamed Peter. Remember he told him, you're a rock. You know, you're the rock. Uh, or you're a pebble, I should say. And he said, upon this rock I will build my church, speaking, I believe, of himself. And James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, he sur surnamed him Boanerges, and that is the sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into the house. And the multitude comes together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. So he's got a crowd of people there. He's got his disciples with him. And what do the locals think? And when his friends heard of it, we hardly ever read this part of the scripture here. They went out to lay hold on him, for they say he is beside himself. The guy has actually lost his mind. What in the world is he doing? Who, do, who does he think he is? He's out of his mind. And that's what the locals thought of him. Maybe that's what the people think of us. Maybe that's what they think of me or you or whoever is in the church of God. So who, who did the calling here? We know that Jesus called these folks, but in, back just a few pages in Matthew 22, Jesus uh, makes a statement here, Matthew 22 and verse 14. Uh, Matthew 22 and verse 14, he says, For many are called and few are chosen. Now, I could go in and we could read the story about the sower of seeds, how it's like the gospel message, and it just ended, in it, you know, indiscriminately, the sower just throws seeds out. He's like, he has a bag by his side. He reaches in, grabs a handful, and just throws it in the wind, carries some of it, and some of it lands on the rocks, some of it on the, on the bushes and trees, and, and some of it falls on the, the old, gray, uh, old uh, clay ground, which is hard and won't hardly grow anything, and some of it falls into some real fertile ground. I, I was out on a location here not too long ago. It was the ex it, we excavated this site and got it ready to put rock on it so that we could store big giant pumping units and machinery and, and compressors, and it was an old site of a where there used to be a chicken farm. And that ground was growing some of the best-looking weeds I've ever seen in my life. I thought, somebody ought to till this up and put a garden here because, I mean, those weeds were broad-leafed and green and lush. And I was thinking, man, a garden would be excellent here. You know, we're fixing to cover it up with rock. I hated that, you know, because all of that had decomposed year after year after year. And I bet you that was going to be some of the most fertile. So I almost said, let's scrape this up, take it somewhere, and we'll put some rock over the soil underneath because I'm sure that has been sitting there and it's, it's really fertile for a garden. In John, the 15th chapter, we'll go over there. So the call does go out, and you see, as I said, by maybe your own church group, the empty seats are there. Not everyone responds. 
unfortunately. And I ask again the question, do you want to live forever? What do people think going to church is all about? Is it a habit that we get into every week? Is it a routine? Yes, I guess to some degree it is. I personally admit to that. I am a person of routine. I hate to get out of my routine because I have so many things to do, and if I get out of my routine, I will forget something. I'm just that way. And each week when I prepare a sermon, there is a routine I go through, and I, I sit down early in the morning, very early, usually before anybody gets up, and uh, I look through all of my notes, and I formulate an outline, and then I put together a sermon, and I go over it about three or four times. That's just my routine. And then when I'm done with it, I pr print it in my little food, uh, food processor. Maybe that's where some of it ought to go. <laughs> I put it in my word processor, I should say, which is some 20-something years old. I was, this morning I was thinking, this thing's going to crater on me one morning. I'm going to be out of luck. I'm not going to have a handwritten scratches I'm going to have to bring with me because of this old, computer is so old. But I type it in one more time because it makes me go over it again and again and again and again so that I'm not just fumbling around when I get up here to pre present it. And that routine sometimes becomes monotonous for me. It's like, here I am again for the, you know, 378th time, you know, preparing a sermon to come to services. I wish it was different. I wish there was something I could do that was different to change that. And I, I'm sure you do when you get ready to come to church and you get dressed, take your shower, shave, whatever you do, to do your hair. And you think, here we go again, another week of services or church. It can become monotonous. But what is the purpose of it all? The goal out there in the future, in your life, what is the purpose of all of this religion that we have, that we believe? We're supposed to believe down to the bottom of our heart, to be convicted and to have faith, as, they, uh, as Bill said in the opening prayer, of the faith of Abraham. All of this ancient history here that we have lying on our laps here, this book that goes back to the very foundation of the earth. This book is older than the rocks out there on the ground. This book is inspired by a God that lives in the third heaven. This book is his word to human beings, and we get so mundane about it. We get so callous against it. We get so bored with it sometimes. And I don't want to ever see that happen to me or to you or to anybody who believes the gospel because we can sort of just drift away like an old canoe that broke loose from the dock and it just drifts on down like I did when I was a young boy when the river down here in East Texas, the Sabine River, dried up. And you could step across what was left of the river because it was so dry. It was a little stream about this wide. And I walked down that riverbed, and there's this old boat laying in the bottom of the river. Been there for years. It was half embedded in the sand. You know, it had just let go, and it drifted down the stream and just sort of sank. Can that happen to Christians? Yes. You can become bored with this news, this good news that was given to us by the Son of God. And we have to reinvigorate that. Remember, uh, Jesus talked about the churches there in Ephesus, how they had grown, you know, they, they had let the fire go out. They, he wanted them to restoke the fires in their life, that they some of them, like Laodicea, to become lukewarm in their conviction and their uh, belief and trust. You know, Jesus himself went into some cities, and he couldn't do any mighty works because of their unbelief. They saw the miracles. They saw what was happening around them. They saw people healed. They saw people raised from the dead. I wonder how long it would take today if Jesus were here on this earth and he performed all of these miracles. How many days, weeks, and months would go by before people would go, uh, I think I'd rather watch the Dallas Cowboy football game today than to watch another miracle. You know what? It would happen again. People would get tired of it. They would get bored with it. They would get, you know, disenfranchised with it. They would become disconnected with it. I've seen that happen in religion my whole life. I truly have seen people walk out of a door in a church group and never return. It dumbfounds me. When we're talking about what is at stake here, 
what this promise offers each of us, it is, it's like the, the rare jewel that Jesus said a man finds in a pasture somewhere and he goes and sells everything that he has to buy that field. Because what, he's, what is there is worth more than anything he has. Combined, everything. So what does he do? He goes and sells it all and buys the field and he is, becomes more wealthy than he ever imagined. And I guess Jesus was doing that, not just to say it's about money or wealth or anything, but about what the reward that he's offering each of us. In John, the 15th chapter, I'll go there. He says in verse 16, You, are, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. A lot of people think, I'm going to choose Jesus. I think today I'll become a Christian. They don't realize that it's like lightning strike. It's like being, you know, when a young couple comes together and they are married and they go on a honeymoon. Like this singer, I saw this singer one time. She said, we went on a honeymoon. I was, had a singing career. We went on a honeymoon. I came back from the honeymoon. I was pregnant. So the, the singing career was over. I had to devote all my time to this little child that was on, on the way. It's like a lightning strike, the call from God that goes out to you in conversion. And he said, I ordained you that you should come and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatsoever you shall ask in the Father in, in my name, he will give it you. These things I commanded you that you loved one another. Jesus chose each of you. He's, he's chose, chosen you and called you for a great purpose. In Mark, the 10th chapter... This was a story that came to my mind. There was a rich young ruler. Jesus is walking down the street with his disciples, probably with a crowd behind him. And a man comes running out of nowhere and runs up to him. And the, if you read all the accounts, actually skids to his knees in front of Jesus. He bows down before him on his knees to Jesus. And he says... And when, look at verse 17. When he had gone, there came one running and kneeling to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do to have that I may inherit eternal life? Here's a guy that wants to have eternal life. He's got all the things he could ever love and imagine. He's got wealth. He's got power. You read all the accounts, you find out he's a rich, young ruler. So he's got, a, got his mark in society. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? There's none... There, there is none good but one that is God. Jesus, even in his own, there's some debate there about how, why he said that. You know, Jesus in his own physical state was not a spirit being. And he considered God as the only source of good, you know. And, and of course, he himself was good. I'm not saying Jesus was not good. Jesus, Jesus was perfect. He was without sin. We know that. He said, you know the commandment, do not commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't break, be, bear false witness, don't fraud. Some of the commentaries say that he recited the second of the two tables of stone. That one may have been one that was written about God, you shall not have any other gods before me, you shall not take his name in vain. But the second one perhaps had all of these that have to do with human relationship. And that makes sense, really, because Jesus said on, on several occasions that it was on these two hang all the laws, that you love God and that you love your fellow man. And he answered and said, Master, all these I observe from my youth. So we've got a guy who's got great moral character. I'm going to list four of them here. He's got great moral character. He has a craving for eternal life. Something is missing in his life. He realizes, I've got all these goods, I've got wealth, I've got power, but something is restless in his soul, and he wants eternal life. The third is, he's unlike all the other rulers who could have cared less about religion. They were had their ambitions, they had their goals, they had their wealth, their money, power, all of that, that was their goal. And fourth, he came running and kneeling earnestly. So he's like a disciple. He wants to do what's right, it seems. And Jesus beholded him and loved him. Jesus didn't hate the guy. And he said unto him, one thing you lack, go sell 
Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and take up your cross, the cross, and follow me. Now that term there really means deny yourself. Deny your own ambitions and come and follow me. And he, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and the disciples says, How hard is it that they that how hard is it for those that have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his word, and Jesus answered again and said, Children, how hard? He almost asked them the question again, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Of course, that was just a, an analogy there, a, a, a statement uh, that was common in the land. Then for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, and they were astonished out of measure. It was like, wait a minute, how can this be? How can anyone enter into the kingdom? And they, they asked that, then who then can be saved? That was their question. And Jesus looked upon them and says, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And Peter began to say, Lo, we have left you all and followed. We, we've left everything and followed you. And they did. They left their fishing business and they went and followed Jesus. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left. Now this is for the people of God who have given up things. I know there are some of you who have given up jobs, that have given up opportunities. I had a man not too many years ago call me up and he said, I've got this great job opportunity and it pays three or four times what I'm making now. But I have to work on the Sabbath day. What do you think? I hate it when people ask me that question because I have to tell them the truth. You can't take it. You can't give up your faith for a job and money. God knows that this is in front of you. If you will stick to your guns, something will happen. You will get another opportunity that's better than this one, and you won't have to work on the Sabbath day. You can't do it. You have to be committed to God and his commandments because that, that was really an oath that you make when you are baptized. You're making an oath and you're making a promise to God that you're not going to break his commandments. And that's some of the things that I talk about when I, when I uh, counsel someone with baptism. You know, Jesus said you don't want to be like the man that was going to build a house and he didn't count the cost or the king that didn't go out, you know, was going to go out to war and he didn't count all of his soldiers to see if he could win or not. He didn't count the cost. Before you make that commitment, you need to count the cost and what you're willing to give up or not. Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now and in this, now in this time houses and brethren, sister, bro, uh, mothers, children, and lands with, perse with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. It's almost like a test to see if you're willing to give it up. For, but as many, many that are first shall be last and the last first. So in uh, Mark, the 10th chapter, we read of this rich young ruler who had, had, had everything and he wasn't willing to make up the make up, uh, wasn't, wasn't willing to give up those things. I want to go to Luke now. Luke, the 10th chapter, which is a similar story, but quite a bit different outcome. Luke 10 and verse 1. Luke 10th chapter, down in verse 1. And after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he himself would go, was about to go. You know, you don't think all the, all the movies and everything always portray the twelve. But here Jesus... Now he has 70 that he sends forth. So it's growing. Later on, there'll be 120 and then 500 we read about in the, the Paul talked about, you know. So it's increasing as time goes by. Therefore, he said unto them, the harvest is truly great, um, but the laborers are few. 
and that's not the scripture I want, but that, that is one scripture that I did want to read, how he sent out the, um, my, my, my <laughs> word processor did crash this morning, so I may have lost that scripture. I'll just give you the outline of it. Basically, Jesus was coming into town, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. And he, could, he wanted to see Jesus, just like the young rich nobleman. And he was a short guy, kind of like me. Couldn't see over the, the shoulders of all the people that were thronging to Jesus. And as Jesus came in, he went down the way where Jesus was going and climbed up in a sycamore tree. And Jesus saw him and said, Come down, Zacchaeus. This day is salvation. Come to your house. And it says Jesus went into his house. Now, he was like a, a publican, which the Jews and the Pharisees had nothing to do with. They considered them sinners and publicans, all in the same, you know, painted with the same brush. Jesus went to his house, and the man told him, look, I've never defrauded anyone out of any money. And those that I find out I, that have, were short, shorted, I pay them so many times over that to restore them back. So instead of him saying, and he was rich as well, and he had a lot of wealth, and he had a lot of possessions. So instead of him saying, I'm not willing to give it all up, he's saying, I am willing to make amends to those that, that may have gotten defrauded. And, and of course, his, he was searching too for, for Jesus. And, and on that occasion, Jesus said, this day is salvation come to your house. So there was a different in attitude between the two. God, uh, does God call, my next question here, irresponsible, degenerate, sinful people? Does God call sinful people? Certainly the woman that, that was caught in adultery, you know, God said, go, uh, Jesus said to her after, you know, it was all over with, and all the guys that laughed after he reached down and wrote something on the ground. We'd be curious about what that was. It was enough to bring these other guys to their attention that I need to get out of here because I may be next in the accusations. So they all laughed, and she was left there alone. And he said, go and sin no more because no one is here to accuse you. All your accusers have left. But there was one that Acts the ninth chapter, I'd like to read a little bit of this because it is so much of a contrast between the person who was and the person who is. In Acts the ninth chapter, it says, and Saul was yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. And that word in my margin says murder against the disciples of the Lord, and he went into the high priest, and he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any of this way, interesting language there, this way, that is repeated a couple of times in Scripture. Paul in Acts the 22nd chapter said, I persecuted this way. He called it this way. Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, this is a guy who's got a burr on his saddle. He does not like Christianity. He's doing everything he can to persecute Christianity. And he journeyed, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. So he's almost to his destination, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Probably scared him to death. Was this a solar eclipse, a lunar eclipse, whatever? And he fell to the earth and hear, heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And that would have got my attention too, yours too. And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute, down in verse 6. And he, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And I bet you he really wanted to know the answer to that question. And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and you shall be, shall be told what you must do. Later on, it tells us <coughs> excuse me, that uh, the young man Ananias came to him. And uh, let's see, what's that verse down in verse uh, 15? 
And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. This is what God told Ananias. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him how many great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That is a calling there. That's a tremendous calling. That is a tremendous turnaround. <clears throat> Later on, the Apostle Paul would say in Galatians, no doubt you've heard of my conduct in times past. In the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. He never got over the fact of who he was and how he had persecuted the church, but God actually reached out and called him and brought him into the ministry and he became a great evangelist of course we know the story now he wrote so many books 14 or so books of the bible and uh, was a tremendous part in the early new testament church especially to the gentiles did you know that your calling was in the mind of god before the world began it's not now it's not right at this second or when you were converted even in romans the eighth chapter Maybe we can read a little bit of this here before we finish. Romans, the 8th chapter. Uh, get there with you. Romans 8. And down in verse... Uh, get here with you. Verse 28. Romans 8 and verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, not ours. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So who's that talking about? Jesus Christ. He was the firstborn among many brethren. We talked about that last week. He was the first one to be resurrected. I often ask the question to folks, what does the term resurrection mean to you if you're going to heaven? We can maybe delve into that sometime. He says, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And I want you to notice the tense of these words. He predestinated, he called, and whom he called them, he justified. It's got an ED on the end, so it means it's past tense. And whom he justified, them also he glorified. The only explanation you can give here is that in the human beings, from the human being perspective, it is something that happens in the future. If you're not converted, you realize that you give and surrender yourself to Jesus Christ that you are baptized and you become a son of God. You become a child of God. It is something in the future. But to God, it was something that he did before the world began. It's already a past act in his mind. He knew what his plan was going to be, and it included your conversion, your calling, your eventual justification through Jesus Christ. You know, Paul said that, that Jesus died while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And eventually your glorification, your becoming a member of the divine Elohim and a spirit being and, and, and have eternal life or to live forever. Uh, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he called, and I read that, what shall we say, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And that, to me, is the, it's like the icing on the cake. God gave us his son, allowed him to die, and shed his own blood. What else would he not do for us? He's going to give us all things, everything. We get the full benefit of his inheritance that he has planned for us. And who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Um, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, just a few more here. I'll try to wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. I'm 
This is Paul quoting here, writing to the church of Corinthians. He said, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. The Bible uses the term saints. It uses the term elect of God, the faithful, the chosen, the called, as it will. You know, as we read, many are called, but few are chosen. So there is a group of people that are eventually called the saints of God. With all that in every place called upon the name of Jesus our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace which, you, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you enrich, you're enriched by him in all utterance and in knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't fall short of the gifts that God has given you. Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to pause there to say this. We, each day, each week, strive to live a Christian life. And yet, we are physical. We make mistakes, we sin, we break God's laws, His commandments, we fall short. But He is saying here, like we read previously, who can lay anything to God's elect? As long as we get back up, we ask God to forgive us of our sin, He is faithful to forgive us. And we go along, we don't want to get so discouraged and believe that God doesn't forgive us anymore. He knows that we're physical, and he knows that we're striving to live a Christian life. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we're going to be there with Jesus Christ and be like Jesus Christ and be in fellowship with him. And later on in this chapter, he talks about whether you're Jew or Greek, you know, it doesn't matter. What color of the skin you are, what color hair you have, how tall or how short you are. What faults you have had in your past, it doesn't matter. God's grace is sufficient for every human being who is willing to surrender to him. It truly is. Do you think I could be called of God to become one of his children? Some might ask. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 2 Down in verse 11. <laughs> Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. And I asked a question here in my margin. Could this be speaking of me? Could this be speaking of you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ? And, and I, as I said, the, you know, the, the work of Christ was sufficient for every hu human being. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow is worthy of the kingdom. You know, looking back is worthy of the kingdom. So we should strive to continue forward. In, in 2 Timothy, we don't have to turn there, he calls it a holy calling. And in um, uh, 1 Peter 2, he says we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why would we want to go back into the, you know, the canyon there of, of uh, our former life? Um, 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, just a couple of scriptures here, two more left, and I'll, I'll close. 1 Peter 5, down in verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. I, to me, when I read that scripture, it says God is going to make us a perfect being. We're not going to be fallible like we are now in this physical state that we're going to be transformed into a being that is that is perfect in his eyes 
and I, I think that's marvelous. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful goal to have, to to realize. You know, on one occasion, Paul said, "Not many mighty, and not many noble are called." He calls the weak things of the earth, the lowly, to confound the wise. That it is through God's power that we are called and become Christians. In Second Peter uh, one, the last verse here, Second Peter one. In verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant on, of, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertains unto life, and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature and that's where it is that's eternal life the nature that Jesus Christ has the nature that God the Father has having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and besides this, giving all diligence, add to faith, virtue. And he has a whole list of things here that we're to be adding to our life. And, of course, uh, brotherly kindness and love is in, in that. Down in verse 10, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. You won't fall. You won't falter. In the book of Revelation, Revelation 17 chapter, I just, you don't have to turn here, I, don't, I just want to quote it to you what it says. Revelation 17 and verse 14. There shall, these, speaking of the beast's power, shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. If you want to live forever, then you must give your life to Jesus Christ. You must, must submit to him. You must give up everything the world seeks and follow after him. You know, in the book of Revelation, it says, Come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her plagues. You know, that you receive not of her, you know, the curses that come upon the earth. That you're to come out of this world. Um, our focus must be on him and we must set our eyes on him and not have anything come between our relationship with him. How quickly is God willing to establish this relationship and set your life on a path to eternity? It requires faith, yes. It requires hope, yes. <clears throat> it, it requires belief and trust in Him. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you got to believe there is a God, and He's willing to save us. Who else can we trust when you look around, really? After all, He gave His life for each of us before we were born, and now, all he asks is for us to give our lives to him. <coughs> Excuse me, the reward is beyond our imagination and far more than what this world has to offer. <laughs>